One Last House by Tom Moran. They sprinted down the leaf-strewn street, their flashlights cutting wild arcs through the velvety darkness of the October night as they fled from the angry old man. Skirting the woods that bordered the narrow lane, the boys ducked beneath an old footbridge to regroup and to catch their breath. Man, did you see his face? Arthur peeled off his latex mask and ruffled his slick blonde hair. He looked pissed. Well, can you blame him? Doug's voice was muffled beneath the plastic hockey mask. Dipshit lit his jack-o'-lantern on fire with the shaving cream. Roger grinned. Speaking of which, I'm almost out. He shook the can in his fur-covered hand, producing a hollow rattle. Sweat beaded on his chubby forehead and soaked the furry neckline of his costume. Despite the cool temperatures, the thick werewolf suit trapped in his body heat, baking him alive. Much of his face paint had run in dark streaks of black and brown, leaving him looking more like a dirty caveman than the fearsome werewolf he had hoped to portray. Sliding up the billowy sleeve of his ghost costume, Doug checked his watch. It's almost nine now. We'd better head back. We're a long way from home. Yeah, he's right, Raj. My mom would shit if she knew where I was. As if on cue, Arthur's obnoxious ringtone, a jubilant version of Fur Elise, sounded for the third time that evening. Aw, man, not again. Why don't you turn that thing off, Roger asked. That's what I do with mine. If I don't answer, she'll kill me. His face red with embarrassment, he turned around to take the call. What, Mom? In an effort to make him laugh, the two other boys danced around and made faces as he spoke. Arthur shooed them off. Okay, Mom, I will. What was it this time, Roger asked. She wants me home now. There are a bunch of cops over on Sandy Hollow, and Mrs. Barton said that two kids are missing. Oh, that's a bunch of crap. She just wants her little baby boy home. I don't know, Raj. She sounded really worried. Anyway, we'd better get back. He's right. Besides, Doug hefted up the pillowcase he'd used as a trick-or-treat bag. It bulged with candy. I've got enough loot here to last me a month. Roger peered into his bag, poking around with a clawed finger. I've got a little bit of shaving cream, a roll of toilet paper, and a couple eggs left. I say we hit one last house and use this stuff up. What are we going to hit? The only thing left on this road is the old junkyard. That's not true, Roger said as he climbed the short embankment to the side of the road. There's one last house. Nestled atop a low hill, its three stories nearly hidden behind the craggy forms of two hulking sycamores, sat the old Victorian. Cast in deep gloom from the surrounding forest, the home's only light came from a single sneering jack-o'-lantern perched on the top step of the covered porch. I don't know, man. That place is so far from the main road. We could get caught. Nah, Roger said as he slung his sack over his shoulder. We can hit it and be gone without anyone knowing we were there. Besides, it's not like we're in any danger. We're miles away from Sandy Hollow. A sardonic smile crossed Arthur's thin face. I suppose that it wouldn't take too long. Doug knew that he was outnumbered. Sighing in resignation, he secured his mask and shouldered his own bag. Okay, let's do it, but we have to make it quick. I don't want to be late. They moved quickly, keeping low as they crossed the street and maneuvered up the dirt driveway. An ancient model station wagon, its body rusted and vinyl forward paneling peeling, sat just a few yards from the porch. The boys ran to it, using it for cover as they planned their attack. Roger handed his shaving cream to Arthur and took an egg in each hand. Arthur, you go up to the front door and cream that window. Doug, you take the toilet paper and go TP that giant oak on the other side of the house. As soon as you guys are done, get to the street and I'll hit the house with these. Roger palmed two eggs. We'll be halfway home before they even reached the door. As Roger watched, the two boys took their appointed weapons of mischief and ran toward the house. Doug sprinted to the side yard and positioned himself beneath the skeletal branches of the hulking oak tree. Unraveling a short length, he tossed it up over one of the lower branches. The coward of the group, Arthur crept up the overgrown sidewalk into the base of the stairs. When the porch creaked beneath his weight, Arthur dropped to his hands and knees and nearly fumbled the shaving cream can in the process. Terror painted his face as he turned to Roger. Keep going, Roger mouthed as he gestured for the boy to continue. With slow, measured steps, Arthur scaled the front porch and made his way to the mold swath front door. Giving his can a few quick shakes, he held up his arm and scrawled a crude letter F on the grimy glass window. Come on! Roger grew impatient as he watched his friends slowly render a sloppy U, C, and K. The curse completed, Arthur sprang from the porch and hustled to the street. About time. Readying an egg in his pudgy hand, Roger checked to see how Doug was making out. The boy was gone. A single length of toilet paper swayed from one of the tree's lower boughs, and the white roll sat nestled in the grass like a white marshmallow. But Doug was out of sight. Shit, Roger muttered as he motioned for Arthur to join him. 
A concerned look on his face, the boy raced back up the hill. Where the hell is Doug? I don't know. You were the one watching us. They paused and listened. Besides the soft, slippery whisper of the wind-stirred leaves, all was silent. Roger felt his candy-filled gut begin to churn. Something was very wrong. Maybe he went to TP another tree, Arthur offered. Then why did he leave the roll behind? Could he be taking a piss? You know Doug, he had soda earlier. Even Doug wouldn't be dumb enough to piss while we were hitting a house. Do you think he got caught? Roger had considered the possibility that the owner had snuck out and nabbed Doug in the act. The part that gnawed at his nerve and gave him chills beneath his sweat-soaked costume was that they hadn't heard it. Their friend would have certainly made some noise, whether it was a chirp of surprise or shouted a warning to him and Arthur. That is, unless... Roger forced the thought from his mind as he turned to Arthur. You need to sneak around to the side of the house and see what's going on. What? Why me? Because you're faster. We both know I'm slow as hell. I'd never be able to get away in time. Arthur hesitated, nibbled his lower lip as he eyed the oak. Now! Visibly startled, Arthur took off. Roger watched as his friend skirted the wood's edge and looped around the oak tree. Crawling through the shin-high grass and discarded leaves, he moved to the toilet paper roll. Eyes wide, he held it up for Roger. Even through the gloom, Roger could see the crimson splotches that stippled the white tissue. He didn't have long to dwell on its meaning as a shriek pierced the serenity of the night. Arthur tumbled backward, landing on his bottom as he propelled himself with his feet. Holy shit, he screamed in a voice a full octave higher than his normal pitch. Holy shit! Roger felt his lower lip tremble and his eyes tear as he rounded the back of the car to see what Arthur was looking at. Like a zombie from a B-horror flick, Doug shambled from the side of the house. His once white costume clung in blood-soaked ribbons to his slender frame. One arm hung limply at his side, rivulets of red spiraling down the pallid flesh and into his hand. The other held in the slippery pink coils of viscera that spilled from a yawning wound in his abdomen. His mangled vocal cords dangled from an incision in his throat. They slapped against his gore-streaked neck with each step he took. Face drawn and ashen, he stumbled forward, staring out at nothing as his mouth worked a silent scream. Reaching for Arthur with his free hand, his foot became entwined in his own intestines and he fell to the ground. Doug? Arthur managed. The wounded boy twitched and then was still. Behind him, a tall, thin figure emerged from the shadow-cloaked alley between the home and the garage. Dressed entirely in black, he hid his face beneath a chalk-white mask with bulging bloodshot eyes and thin, cruel features. Holy fuck, run, Roger called. The boy sprang to his feet, his body in motion before his sneakers touched the ground. With Arthur at his side, Roger plunged into the woods that bordered the property, oblivious to direction or obstacle, concerned only with getting as far away from the horror as his body would allow. Low branches slapped at his face and briars tore at his costume. The candy he had gorged himself on just hours earlier erupted from his mouth, nearly choking him. Still, he ran, the fear in his veins fueling his flight and anesthetizing his discomforts. He was aware that he was sobbing, could feel the hot threads of tears trailing from his eyes, but he didn't care. It was not time for pride. Up there, Arthur Weiss. Light! Roger saw it too, a luminous oasis amidst the unforgiving darkness of the forest. Perhaps they had made it to the street. They broke through the brush, nearly stumbling over each other as they reached the crumbling pavement. Roger's heart sank. Oh no, it's the junkyard! We ran the wrong way! The rusted cyclone fence, a faded and peeling no trespassing sign hanging from its links, loomed between them and the mountains of discarded appliances and stripped cars. They stretched as far as the boys could see, their dented metallic bodies glinting beneath the yard's many spotlights. Maybe we lost them. Roger craned his head and listened. At first, all he heard was his own labored breathing and strained pulse throbbing in his ears. Then, from somewhere deep in the woods, the unmistakable whoosh of a large body moving through dried leaves and brush. He's still coming, Arthur whined. Coils of razor wire lined the top of the fence, making a climb over the obstacle impossible. Roger scanned the area, noticed a breach in the fence where the crushed body of a Buick had toppled over and pushed through. Tugging his friend's arm, he made for the opening, dropping to his knees when he reached it. He ignored the gravel and broken glass that bit into his palms as he tried to wiggle his girth through the hole. With only his torso on the other side, he felt the hips of his costume catch in the sharp edges of the wire. Hurry up! Arthur shifted from foot to foot as he scanned the surrounding woods for their pursuer. Help me, I'm stuck! Arthur grabbed the fence and hoisted it up. Roger heard his costume tear as he scooted the rest of the way through, maneuvering his thick frame beneath the hood of an inverted car. Much thinner than Roger, Arthur passed through the gap with ease and joined his friend. They stood in a dirt path wide enough to permit passage for a single vehicle. All around, teetering mounds of discarded appliances, stripped cars, and bulky junk loomed above them. 
A crisp breeze whistled through the vacant windows of the old jalopies like breath through gap teeth. It carried with it the pleasant scent of wood smoke mingled with an acrid tinge of gasoline. Where do we go? Arthur asked. Roger considered their surroundings and realized that each labyrinthine turn could lead to a dead end. Their best option was to hide. The killer wouldn't possibly be able to find them amidst all the junk. Find a hiding spot. From just around the bend came the sound of singing. He's coming, Roger barked. Go! Roger scrambled over an ancient model dryer, over the hood of a crushed strip truck, and into the front seat of an old Chevy. The door of the vehicle had been badly dented, making it impossible to close. The inch-wide gap it allowed looked out into the yard. With his knees pulled up to his chest, he squeezed into the corner of the passenger side floor. Through the gap, he watched as Arthur secreted himself away inside an old refrigerator, pulling the door shut behind him. Slightly askew, it dangled precariously from a single rusted hinge. The singing drew closer, and the killer stepped into view. In one hand, he carried Doug's candy sack. In the other, he clutched a knife. Three little pumpkins acting kind of nuts. One got caught and lost his guts. The other pumpkins ran to save their butts. Now two little pumpkins are acting kind of nuts. His voice, sing-songy and high, echoed through the man-made canyon of trash. Roger felt his bladder release, hot urine soaking through the crotch of the furry costume, as the fiend stopped just a few yards from his hiding spot. He placed the bulging sack on the ground and stood in the center of the path, directly between the two boys' hiding spots. The bulging eyes of his mask all-seeing, he turned and studied his surroundings for a sign of the boys. From beneath the latex mask came his twisted song. Two little pumpkins hiding in a dump. With the window crank digging into the fatty flesh of his back, Roger shifted slightly to alleviate the discomfort. The car creaked, and the subtle noise seemed to resound through the cramped vehicle with the intensity of a gunshot blast. Ever so slowly, the killer's head turned to face him. Although the stoic mass proffered little emotion, Roger could feel him smile. He placed a hand over his lips to stifle his whimpers. One got scared and made a thump. The fiend stalked to the car, climbing easily over the dryer as he made for Roger's hiding spot. Panic seized Roger, and he cowered further into the corner, trapped like a rabbit in a hole. Slipping his hand into his costume's pocket, his fingers clawed for his pocket knife. Instead, they closed around his cell phone. With the unit held close to his gut to muffle the sound, he pressed the power button. The killer climbed over the hood of the crushed truck. The killer left the pumpkin a bloody lump. Roger scrolled through his contact list, highlighted the one number he dialed more than any of the others. For a split second, he hesitated, his finger poised above the call button. His glove hand outstretched, the killer reached for the door. Now one little... Roger frowned as he hit the button. The door creaked as it opened. From across the path came the first muffled, electronic notes of fur release. The door nearly opened, the killer stopped and turned toward the sound, his black leather gloves creaking as he tightened his grip on the knife handle. Roger held his breath, looking past the killer into the refrigerator that concealed his best friend. The unit thumped and the door shifted as Arthur undoubtedly wrestled to retrieve his phone to turn the ringer off. Beneath the mask, the killer laughed. Letting the door of the car swing shut, he turned his attention toward the old refrigerator. He wasted no time as he vaulted over obstacles and hurried to his new quarry. Two little pumpkins hiding all alone. One forgot to shush his phone. The killer's attention averted, Roger climbed from his hiding spot and made for the door. If he timed it correctly, he could use Arthur as a diversion and make his escape. The ringtone ceased, but the damage had been done. With a primal scream that echoed through the yard and chilled Roger to the soul, Arthur sprang from his hiding spot. The move proved too late as he landed in the arms of a killer. Seizing the boy by the breast of his costume, he slammed him down against the dirt path. Roger, you fucker! The boy yelled as he struggled against his captor. Roger leapt from the car, scrambling over junk as he fled from the impending slaughter. Don't leave me! Roger glanced back only once, winced as he saw the killer plunge the knife into his friend's neck. Roger! Arthur gurgled. Tears of shame threatened to blind him as he climbed off of the junk mounds and sprinted toward the path. Behind him, Arthur screamed once more, then silence. Roger barely slowed as he came to the junkyard's hulking front gate. Sensing freedom, he plunged through a gap between the wooden doors, his heart pounding in his ears as he continued his flight. His legs burned and a ruthless cramp ripped up his side, but still he ran. Without streetlights, the surrounding trees cloaked the street in thick umbrage. Roger plunged blindly through the darkness. Ahead, Potter's Bridge stretched into the night, its ancient gray timbers seemingly one with shadow. He knew that if he could reach it, he would be safe. 
Just feet from the first plank, he stepped into one of the road's many potholes. Pitched forward, he stumbled off the pavement and over the embankment. Exhausted, he was powerless to help himself as his body flopped down the hill, limbs flailing, bouncing off the rocks and rotted tree limbs. Roger winced as his head bounced off the hard earth, snapping his chin against his chest. All went black. Hello? Roger Carmichael? As Roger regained consciousness, he imagined he was home in his bed. The masculine voice calling for him belonged to his father. Then Roger opened his eyes, and as the night sky materialized in his blurry vision, so did the memories of how he had gotten there. Arthur. He fought back tears as he sat up. His head throbbed, and the red and blue lights flashing from the street above added to the vertigo clouding his mind. A blinding spotlight illuminated his surroundings, and he covered his face to shield his eyes from the painful luminance. Roger Carmichael, the voice called again as the light lowered. It's the police. Can you move? I, I think so. We're coming right down. Stay there. When Roger tried to stand, he realized that he had been clutching his candy sack. Eyes narrowing, he fixated on the bag. He had thought he'd lost it earlier in the night. Fur Elise sounded from inside, startling him. How? With trembling hands, he dumped the contents of the bag out onto the ground. As Arthur's crudely severed head rolled out, coming to a rest on the ragged stump of his neck just a few feet away, Roger screamed. The murdered boy's eyes stared at Roger, accusing him. Between his clenched, blood-speckled teeth was the boy's cell phone. A short text message appeared on the lit screen. Thanks for the treats, Roger. Happy Halloween. See you next year. Roger continued to scream until the paramedics sedated him. <laughs> 